river of life wash it all away you've been searching carrying burden you've been lost and looking for a home you've been drifting cause something is missing you should know that you are not alone brother sisters come on down to that river guaranteed you'll never be the same there's a fountain flowing from the heart of the savior bring your sins and all your guilties to stay let that river of life wash it all away Whoa. Don't be afraid, jump on in, the water is fine Healing in the river of life, come as you are, no time to waste Open your heart and don't be afraid, jump on in, the water is fine There's healing in the river of life Brother, sisters, come on down to that river Guaranteed you'll never be the same Brother, sisters, come on down to that river Guaranteed you'll never be the same There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior Bring your sins and all your guilty stains By the blood of Jesus everything will change Let that river of life wash it all away Whoa! Wash it all away. To come and be with you. Um, I heard that, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, Talia is not feeling well today and had some uh, sickness issues in the middle of the night and isn't feeling so good. So thanks for inviting us over for dinner, Kenny. I really appreciate that. So, yeah, so... No, it was a great time and a wonderful dinner and really enjoyed playing uh, basketball out in the driveway for about 45 minutes to an hour with the kids. And my knees uh, told me this morning, you are not capable of doing that anymore and you need to stop that. So I'm a little stiff there this morning, but still super glad to be with you guys. Uh, Kenny says you always just want to know a, a little bit of an update uh, on what's going on with family. Uh, I would say that we're in a kind of stable place overall. Um, if, if you're new, uh, we've been on quite a journey and uh, don't want to retell that whole journey, but uh, our daughter, uh, Alana, who now 28, then 26, uh, had a massive stroke March 9th, 2021, and we nearly lost her, and that was a transforming journey. Uh, she was in a pretty unhealthy relationship. Uh, we moved to Salem, January, Salem, Oregon, January of 2022. That was a catalyst for her getting out of that toxic relationship as she was recovering. Uh, she's in another relationship, which is uh, calmer and nicer. Uh, still, we wish she would step away from that and take a little bit of time to figure out who she is and her identity. Uh, but we are very grateful she's flourishing in her work. She just got sent out to the Dalles. Uh, she works in the mental health field and got sent out to the Dalles to kind of evaluate a house uh, and uh, evaluate a workplace house and kind of help them get structured and organized. And she's just gaining more responsibility and flourishing. We're grateful for that. Our younger daughter, Becca, is... Uh, in Lansing, Michigan, and she also is in a fairly new position. She transferred uh, for jobs and has really built a new community up, and that's exciting and has a much larger network of relationships. And we're still in Salem, and uh, I'm still working in the same position. Darlene is still in transition, uh, working for Edward Jones as an on-call, uh, wants to do something else and still waiting on God's timing for that to happen. Uh, my job's been very weird, but whose job isn't weird? So 
Uh, I'm a former pastor in the Christian Missionary Alliance for over 30 years. Uh, Kenny and I uh, served when he was in Eagle River. I was in Anchorage, Alaska, and we used to get together. And after we came down, kind of reconnected and he has graciously invited me out here for the fourth time. Uh, so that's uh, an amazing gift. So thank you. And just uh, thank you. Any questions anyone has afterwards, happy to answer those. But just wanted to uh, share a little bit of what's going on. So uh, Kenny has been talking about the fruit of the Spirit and joy, from what I hear. And uh, we are putting a stop to that today. So... <laughs> So uh, let's open our Bibles to the story of the garrison demoniac and the casting out of the pigs. <laughs> Nothing? She's not listening. Oh, no. <laughs> that would have landed better if you would have been paying attention. So. <laughs> so. I will get there in a second, not to the garrison demoniac, but uh, I was actually just in my devotional reading. This is not where I'm going to land. I'm going to land in a different place, but I happen to just be going through Psalms. And as I go through Psalms, I love them because I love the wrestling match that we can have with God in the midst of the Psalms. And I came to Psalm 13 and it just made me go, okay, what do we do with this? I'm just going to read the whole psalm. This isn't where I'm going to preach from, actually, but it started the train for me when I was thinking of what to share when Kenny invited me for this morning. That very short psalm simply says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. What? <laughs> Four verses of my life is miserable. I don't get it. How long will you hide your face from me? My enemies are triumph. I'm going to sleep in death. But I trust in your unfailing love, for you have been so very good to me. Well, which is it? And the reality is, is the psalmist kind of captures what I think is on a lot of our hearts most of the time, is it's both. Life is really hard, and it's really painful at times, and we face overwhelming battles that we think are going to undo us, and we wonder where God is, and we wrestle why he's not doing something. And then at the same time, we remember and reflect and have seen the handiwork of God and see his presence in the daily experiences of our lives and go, he is yet so very good to me. And like David, we're sad and we're, I'll use the word, joyful in the midst of it all. And so this started taking me kind of down a, a thought process of what would I want to share because this just landed hard on me of that tension we feel as we live our lives. And I started thinking, where would I want to share from? And God took me to a famous Old Testament story and a very unique one. And it's found actually in Genesis chapter 32. And that is where I'm going to be. So if you have a Bible or your smartphone and want to pull that open, it's actually not going to be on the screen. So I'm going to make you work a little today. Uh, Genesis 32 is the story of Jacob wrestling in the night with God. Are, is there anyone in here that like actually wrestled, like competitively wrestled? Any competitive wrestlers? I was not. Okay, no one. I was a basketball player. I didn't do wrestling. But I think I have a brother. And so when you have a brother, you do competitive wrestling. It's just not for points. Uh, the downside of this is my brother it was four and a half years older than me. So my record uh, was undefeated. I lost every time. So uh, I was a zero for whatever in wrestling with my brother. And I remember one particular time just stuck in my memory. I was about five years old and he made me mad. And my nine and a half year old brother and I decided I'm literally going to go to the mat on this one. He was pretty bemused by the whole situation because, oddly enough, a nine and a half year old doesn't have much trouble taking out a five year old. And he would just kind of throw me down and I'd get back up and he'd throw me down and I'd get back up. And I remember one time I was just, I literally, I was just enraged and I had kind of lost control. And I think even my nine and a half year old brother was like, oh, he's gone over the deep end. I was in the midst of a complete 
angry meltdown, and if I could have done harm to him, I probably could have, but I wasn't going to, because nine and a half and five. And he literally has me on the ground, and he's got his knee on my back, and my body, my arms pinned underneath me, and he's like, just quit, okay? Just quit. And I'm like, I know, and I'm just raging at him. And I'm like, I refused to quit. Until finally, I think he held me there. I, you know, my five-year-old brain says 30 minutes. It was probably five. But I literally exhausted myself to the point where I felt like I couldn't even move. I was so angry. And then I finally just picked myself up off the floor. But I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't tap out. I wouldn't give up. Now, there's no nobility in that and what I was doing at the moment, I can assure you. But even back then, I was pretty darn stubborn and wouldn't say I quit. Well, there's a story in Scripture, Genesis 32, about a very famous individual named Jacob, one of the patriarchs. And he too wouldn't quit. And he wouldn't give up. And he wouldn't say, I yield. Now, if you don't know the Jacob story, I'll just say very, very quickly, there's so much more that could be said. Uh, Jacob had a bit of a reputation. If you are familiar with the story of Jacob, son of Isaac and Rebekah, Isaac the son of Abraham and Sarah, and uh, the original patriarchs, and Jacob and his twin brother Esau were born at the same time, and Jacob was the one who grasped his brother's heel as they were coming out of the womb. And that's how the name Jacob came. It means uh, one who grasps the heel. And that kind of became the kind of well-known uh, marking point of Jacob's story because Jacob was a conniver. He was sneaky. <laughs> he was manipulative. He did all kinds of things to try and figure out how to make life work. Yet for some reason, God put the blessing on Jacob for the future of the nation. Jacob had tricked his brother Esau, who wasn't the brightest bulb on the lot, over a pot of stew to get the birthright. And then later in life, as his father was getting old and was going to pronounce the blessing on the sons, conspiring with his mother, who liked him better, dad liked Esau better, uh, pretended to actually be Esau and bring wild game and put a hair on his arms uh, from an animal to try and convince dad, who's a little feeble-minded and a little uh, bad eyesight, that he was Jacob, so that, Jake, uh, so that um, Isaac would put the blessing on Jacob, thinking it was his son Esau. And this ticked off Esau to no end. And so after the blessing was given to Jacob, he disappeared and ran off because Esau was so angry, he was wanting to take Jacob's life. And so Jacob, well, his story goes on, and he ends up with uh, two women in a very interesting story that reflects a very different culture than we're in today, thank goodness. And he has uh, two wives that uh, he is connected with, and they are having children and doing their thing. And then all of a sudden, he finds out that Esau is nearby. And Esau is wanting to meet up with him. And uh, so in the context of where we're about to be, he finds out that Esau has 400 men who are coming out to meet up with him. And he's sure they're going to take my life. So he sends out gifts and all kinds of things, three different servants with three different sets of gifts to say, oh, your brother is so glad to see you, you who I tricked and connived out of your birthright and the blessing. And he even, as the night comes near, takes all his possessions and his flocks and his herds, and he divides them up into two different camps, saying, look, if Esau attacks, maybe at least half of my goods and possessions and servants will survive. And then, it says, Jacob spends the night alone. And that's the story I want to talk about today. So if you have your Bible, Genesis 32, 22 to 32. Genesis 32, 22 to 32. That night... Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, and crossed, crossed the fort of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. 
Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. It's a weird story, let's be honest. And not a lot of explanation is exactly given around it. But I do think it's very instructive and very encouraging to us to tell us, and this is kind of the main idea that I want to share today with you uh, out of this message, is that uh, we can come to God in our dark nights and struggle with and before him. We can come to God in our dark nights and struggle with and before him. Now, this story is pretty legendary. It's very, very well known. Uh, as a matter of fact, in a, a later uh, minor prophet, the book of Hosea, uh, Hosea actually goes back and kind of recounts the story. Are we got the scripture up there for Hosea? Um, as Hosea talks about a time when Israel, long after this story takes place, was in a place of exile and was in their wanderings because of their continued sin against God, Hosea is speaking to the nation and says he will punish Jacob, not this literal character, but Israel the nation, according to his ways and repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he grasped his brother's heel. As a man, he struggled with God. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. He found him at Bethel and talked with him there. The Lord God Almighty, the Lord is his name. This amazing story is just not an apocryphal remembrance or a fanciful dream. It happened. It took place. And it starts with Jacob, the character Jacob in Genesis 32, entering into the place of night alone with God. We really don't even know what Jacob had in mind when he separated himself in this manner. We're not given insights to understand, but I suspect that he was hoping and seeking the presence of God. Brother Esau, with 400 of his men, is bearing down on him. He has sent gifts. Last he knew, Esau wanted to kill him. This seems like a good time to go, dear God, help me. And I don't know about you, but perhaps you have uh, often come to that place in your life where it's like, I've run out of figuring out how to make this work. I don't know what to do. And in the middle of the night, it dawns on you, like maybe it dawns on me sometimes, this would be a good time to cry out, dear God, help me. I suspect that's what Jacob was doing. Why God chose to manifest himself in this angelic form of a physical presence that Jacob could wrestle with, commentators have spent a long, long time trying to understand. Why is the angel of God able to come down in a physical form that Jacob could physically grapple with? What does a wrestling match like that look like? I, you know, that would put up anything that WWE WrestleMania has ever offered. This would be a whole lot more impressive to see Jacob and the angel of God wrestling in the night. And what did it even look like to wrestle? I've always kind of wondered that. I mean, were they literally rolling on the ground and wrestling and trying to grapple with one another? We don't really know what it looks like, but it says he wrestled throughout the night. And he meets with God alone. And God reveals himself. And he grapples with the angel in the dark of the night alone, terrified and afraid about his future, sending off his wives and his children, separating his servants and his possessions in two camps because he's not sure what's going to survive the next day. And sometimes the greatest challenge, I think, for us is because we rarely experience an outside force, I'm not saying we don't, 
but we rarely experience an outside force who brings that immediacy of threat to us. We resist going out alone into the dark of the night to wrestle with God. We keep ourselves distracted and preoccupied, busy with stuff, enough with our jobs and our houses and our recreational pursuits, for some of us with kids and grandkids and all kinds of wonderful things to do and keep ourselves going that we never say those niggling questions in the back of our mind, those wrestlings with, those struggles of, those doubts, we just go, la, 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 I'm not going to deal with that. And God, I think, often would want to invite us out alone into the dark of night, and begin to wrestle. It's oftentimes, not always, but a place we can't go with others. Sometimes the place where we have to be stripped away from everything that we take solace in, like Jacob was that night. If you think of the story that prepared Jesus for his ministry, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it's a very interesting story. Jesus coming off his baptism and the remarkable presence of the Trinitarian God, the Spirit descending on him like a dove, the voice of the Father speaking to him, the announcement of who he was as a beloved son. Next moment, Jesus, full of the Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end, he was very very hungry. An amazing affirmation of the baptism, and then the Spirit says, let's go out into the wilderness. Let's go where it's only you relying on me and the Father where there are no other outside supports, where there's nothing else you can trust and hold on to, where there are no our other disciples, where there isn't even bread to eat, and lean into me in preparation for the three and a half years I'm about to call you into. I would have loved to have had a ministry which said, look, the Father's identification over me, he calls me a beloved son, I'm ready to go. No, you have to go into the place of the desert or the dark of night, and you have to be with me and wrestle and experience challenges. And it's not something we can just manufacture in our lives. I mean, we can go out and be alone in the woods and go camping and say, I'm just gonna hang out, but a lot of times this is not about geography, it's about a condition of the heart and the soul. It's about awareness of, I have been relying on other things or trusting in other supports to hold me up and rely, and sometimes we get experiences of brokenness and sorrow that overwhelm us, and God calls us to say, what are you going to rely on in the dark space, in the difficult place, when all the supports are gone? So are there any uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe nerds out there? Anyone? Thank All right, we got two. Was that a third? Did I see one? All right, there we go. There's a handful of you out there. Okay, I'll tell the story anyway. So uh, I love those movies. I grew up reading comics as a kid. I was totally into them. And so watching these movies come to life on the screen has been kind of watching some of the best moments of a not always so great childhood come to life. And so as I've watched these moments come, uh, there were 20 plus movies all interconnected that led up to a movie called Avengers Endgame. So even if you don't know anything about them, a lot of you might be familiar with, and there's a part in that movie where uh, there's a small group of heroes fighting the ultimate big bad Thanos, and they all get taken out, and the only one who's left conscious is Captain America, Steve Rogers. And Thanos calls down and his army transports and magically materializes, because you can do that. And they're going to take over the world, and Thanos stands with an army of thousands of characters and creatures behind him that are ready to defeat everyone. And Captain America, the last conscious Avenger, gets up, gash, straps on the shield that he attaches to his arm, closing up the bloody arm that he's got, stands up and begins to slowly walk towards the army, alone, hopeless, no chance of victory. 
He's not gonna, he couldn't defeat Thanos by himself. Now Thanos stands with an army of tens of thousands behind him. But he keeps walking because in the dark of the night, he knows that his responsibility as a hero is to keep going forward. Now, if you know the story and are familiar with it, uh, there's a very lovely moment in which some magic portals started opening and a lot of heroes start appearing, but hopefully that inspires some of you to watch the movies and I don't know how that happened. You gotta watch the 20 that come before it though. So it's a really big life commitment. So, but sometimes we're called like Captain America to walk forward into the dark of the night when it seems like the odds are overwhelming. And even though we're alone and there doesn't seem to be anyone there to support us or to walk with us, God invites us to go forward. Now, the tenacious manner of this battle is pretty unique. God, for his own reasons that we aren't clearly told, takes on a form that Jacob could wrestle with. And as they battle, Jacob's role seems to be to hold on for dear life. You ever felt like your place in life about all you can do is hold on for dear life? <laughs> Angel says, let go. And he says, not until you bless me. I don't get the sense, and we talk about the passage here where he says you have overcome, but I don't get the sense that, you know, Jacob threw the angel down and pinned him one, two, three. The overcome was I didn't let go. He tenaciously held on and said, I need to be blessed by you. And yet part of the understanding of the angel of God's work in Jacob's life was to help him understand you have held on and not let go, but you're going to experience what it's like when you walk through this pain of battling with me in the night. And he touches him on the hip socket and it goes out and it says, Jacob walks with a limp for the remainder of his life. There's a couple interesting things that happen now as this interchange also takes place. He asks, what's your name? The angel says, what's your name? Now, that's so much more than if you came up to me and said, my name is Jeff. In this context, when he says, what's your name? He's basically asking, who are you? What, what's your identity? What's your character? Was so much more wrapped up in the idea of your name. And Jacob answers with the idea of who he is. I am Jacob. I'm the one who grasped the heel. I'm the deceiver. That's me. And sometimes the hardest part, and the reason a lot of us resist going out into the darkness alone and keep ourselves distracted with all kinds of things of this world, is we don't not only want to be exposed by God, but we don't want to see ourselves. We don't want to see the brokenness of our own spirit. We don't want to see that maybe we're relying on things that are not him. We're relying on our possessions or our security or our talents or our capacity or being loved by another or getting our identity from a workplace. God wants us to perhaps see that in the darkness of the night, I've trusted in other places. And I think about what I've shared with some of you uh, through the times I've been here through a 16 month depression I went through as a lead pastor. Part of the realization was not coming to the realization of I don't believe in God or I don't know God or I'm not really a Christian. All those things were absolutely true, but my identity rested far more on what I thought of myself and my performance than what God thought of me. And that was what he was inviting me out into the darkness of night to deal with. I had final say, not God. I didn't. I mean, in the cosmic sense, I know I didn't. But in the way I managed and coped with life, what I thought was of the greatest opinion, when I thought it was good enough, then everything was fine. Sometimes in the desert, we have to get seen for what's going on in our hearts and what God wants to reveal. We want to go into the wilderness to get blessed. I'm sure Jacob started this, if I had to guess, with God, reveal yourself in a way that Esau isn't going to kill me. Can we do that? And instead, God took Jacob on a journey 
of seeing his own heart condition, that he is Jacob, that he needed to release uh, that self-reliance and pride that had so defined his life. I think that happens all throughout Scripture and so many of the characters. Of, you remember the story of uh, Peter after his three-time three denial of Jesus before the rooster crows, and then Jesus' three-time affirmation of Peter, do you love me in John 21? Peter reaffirmed, you know that I love you. And the third time he said he was hurt that Jesus asked him, why are you asking me this question over and over again? You know that I love you. But God's work still wasn't done because Peter still wrestled with something that we all wrestle with. John 21, 19 to 22 talks about it. And he talked about what would happen and said, yes, you do love me. And you're eventually going to experience what it's like to suffer as I have suffered. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to Peter, follow me. And then Peter's like me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, was following them. And then Peter saw him and said, what about him? I don't want to look at me. I don't want to think about what's in store for me. I don't want to think about the ultimate call that I'm going to have a very challenging and painful end to my life because of the commitment I have to follow you. What's going to happen with this guy? I want to look at someone else or some other circumstance or some other thing. And Jesus said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. And when Jesus called Jacob and Peter and me, he says, I want you to follow me. I want you to experience the joy of knowing your belovedness and your belonging, even if it means walking through the valley of the shadow of death. When David committed his famous sin with Bathsheba and it ended up costing the child's life who came out of it, that all comes out of the famous story of being confronted by the prophet Nathan. And as long as a story was being told by Nathan about a fictionalized character of someone who was unjust and unfair, Nathan was full of right, or David was full of righteous anger that such a horrible thing would be done as to take one sheep from one man who had only one little sheep when he had all these sheep, a king had all these sheep, and David said, that guy should die. And what happens in 2 Samuel 12, 7? We come to the place, I think that's there, is it? The next passage. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. My story, it's about you. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you, king of Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I called you into this place, and yet now you have pursued your own desires and longings and taken from Uriah, his wife Bathsheba, You've put Uriah to death by putting him on the front lines. You chose your own path. You need to be seen for who you are. That's a scary place. It's a scary place to admit, God, I trust you to see me more than I trust myself. But here's the good news. When we get seen for who we really are, what does God meet us with? condemnation, judgment, his grace, his mercy, his compassion. But the problem is for me, as long as I'm holding on myself into the things that I won't let go of, I can't be released so that God can reveal who he truly is. I'm too committed to holding on to the image that I've created for myself. So, the angel of God asked Jacob's name, but Jacob then comes in back return and says, well, tell me your name. He says, well, interesting response. He replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. Well, doesn't it just seem tit for tat? Doesn't it just seem fair that if, you know, I ask you what your name is, you can ask me what my name is? He said, you know who I am, Jacob. I am the God who has walked with you. I am the God who has led you. I am the God who has called you. You know me. You can trust me. You can trust my character. Even in the dark of the night, alone as we wrestle, you can trust who I am. J. 
Jacob wrestled with God and had overcome him in that he didn't let go until he grasped the blessing of God. The tenacious battle that we sometimes experience as we wrestle with God is not I need to win over God, but I win when God reveals himself to us and we see him for who he is and his love and his grace and his compassion overshadows the darkness we see in the night. So sometimes we're called into the night, but the second part, we often come away walking with a limp. Henry Nouwen calls this the wounded healer. Sometimes it might be broken in body, but more often than not, it's being broken in our self-sufficiency. It's being broken in the idea that I can make it work in my own power and strength, that somehow I can manipulate life or people or even God himself to make life go the way I want. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9, has this famous encounter with God where he's wrestling with a, a challenge, a physical infirmity that exists in his own life. And in 2 Corinthians 12, it says, because of these surpassingly great revelations, these revelations of what God was allowing him to see in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, a messenger of Satan. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Satan brought something into Paul's life to drag him down, and Paul legitimately said, God, would you please take this away? And he pleaded three times for it to happen, and God says, well, you're just going to carry this one, and it's going to be your story, because my grace is sufficient in your weakness, because it's going to cause you to rely more deeply in me. And so Paul says, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Jacob and Paul can never claim again, it's going to be fine. It's all going to be okay. If your definition of okay is adversity will not be in my path. I won't experience difficulty and suffering. The life-changing, shaping direction impact that takes us in a new direction that shows us that who we are and what we ultimately be comes from God. Jacob was changed. Paul was changed. We experience new life and new hope because of the grace that Jesus Christ does and walks in our lives. I want to read an update from you that I got from uh, a friend. And there it is. Her name's Katie. And Katie is I'm 41 years old, mother of four boys, 18, 16, 14, 12. Katie's married to Aaron. Aaron was my youth pastor in Anchorage, Alaska. And we served together for five years. And Katie recently came down um, with a disease, first was misdiagnosed, was thought to be an infection that led to sepsis, but they later determined it was called lymphatic myocarditis. If you don't know what it is, don't feel bad, neither did I. It sounds awful. I see a couple of nodding heads. It's terrible heart disease that she's now in a hospital and was flown down to Portland, Oregon from Anchorage, Alaska, because they have a heart specialty clinic there that does phenomenal work. And she's starting to experience some measure of recovery, but the disease does such damage to the heart that as a 41-year-old active person who hiked and was physically fit and was in amazing shape, still has the possibility of a heart transplant on the table for her and her future. 41 years old, physically fit. Amazing shape, four boys, loving husband. And her husband, Aaron, wrote these words on those caring bridge things in the hospital that we perhaps have all seen when people go in for medical realities. Aaron wrote this, why is one of my favorite words. I like understanding things and why helps me get there, but not always. The reason I bring this up is that there's a strong desire that wells up within me to know the how and the why. The answer to these questions can steer us clear of many troubles and sometimes lead us on a productive path, but the challenge with this approach is it often leads to more questions and sometimes we get to the end of our ability to understand. We, meaning in this current reality, find ourselves in one of those places that's beyond our reach. We can see little flashes of 
for potential reasons, but we don't see the whole picture. And I feel like this is where the Lord does some of his greatest work. We move past the problems and challenges of the immediate, and we get a glimmer of a God that is larger and wiser than our expectations. We don't know why these things are happening, but we can know who sees and hears us. And he has the, re- the, he has the wisdom to redeem and restore the most difficult of situations. Aaron and Katie are very honest in, about the hard and painful journey they're on. But they are getting redirected in the dark of the night back to the God who has met them in grace even as they don't understand the battle that they're facing. But it's in that wrestling we sometimes get re-identified. God invites us to enter into this wrestling match where we ask questions and wrestle and struggle and it changes us, just like Jacob was changed. We are called to hold on and persevere and we get renamed, just as Jacob was literally renamed. His name changed from Jacob, one who grasped the heel, to literally the name Israel, which would become the name of the nation. And that word means one who struggles with God. Think about that. God called a man who wrestled and held on in the dark of the night and said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, one who grasps the heel. Now you are one who struggles with God, Israel. And that name would stay with him and with the nation as a whole forevermore as they struggled and ebbed and flowed. And some would say to this day, still struggle and ebb and flow with God. I think getting renamed is a beautiful thing. And it's not always literal, obviously. For most of us, our battles and our struggles don't literally cause us to experience a new name. But there's a new sense of character and identity. As we have gone through that journey we went through with Alana, nearly losing our child. I have uh, in my workplace... Uh, A woman who's a speech-language pathologist uh, just said a very kind thing to me. She said, Jeff, you always seem to be able to just keep your head about you, and even when things are frustrating, you don't get overwhelmed. Why is that? Very kind thing to say. And I didn't plan it. I didn't think about it. I didn't go, ah, what would be a thing to say in response? I just kind of spilled out of me, and I said, Nicole... When you're looking at your child on a ventilator tube, not sure if they're gonna live or die, the work trials don't seem nearly so big of a deal as they used to. Because I've been, I think, renamed. Now my name hasn't changed, but God's been at work in my heart. Now, do not get me wrong, I get annoyed. Three days ago, I wanted to quit. But I get Brock back to that center place where I go, no, God is good and he has that work and he is with me and he will continue to walk with me. And God loves wrestling. I'm convinced of that. He loves wrestling, honest, unpresumptuous, determined wrestlers who hold on to God and cry out. That's the point of the parables that Jesus told. One parable Jesus said was told literally that you might pray and not give up. Why do we have to get told that this parable is so that we would pray and not give up? Because you know what you're going to want to do sometimes? Give up. And Jesus says, hold on. Wrestle. Continue on. Walk with me in the battle. Now, there's a caveat here. This wrestling is not a demanding spirit that tells God, hey, you owe me. How come? This is not fair. What's the deal? You better pony up, God, if I'm going to keep following you. But God does love when we recognize that the one who is worthy to be trusted and recognized, we don't always understand our circumstances, and we bring ourselves before him. And there's no one that exemplifies that better to me than Job, that amazing story in the Bible where he spends 30 plus chapters wrestling with God going, I've done everything I can. This does not seem like what you've called me into is fair. 
And he has three friends who keep telling him, well, you must have done something. It's probably your fault. And then God shows up in a whirlwind, doesn't give Job any answers as to the behind the scenes workings of what was happening with Satan and simply says, this is who I am. And he gets a picture and Job says, OK, I didn't know what I was talking about. I put my hand over my mouth. What changed in Job's circumstances? Nada. But he saw when he wrestled and God showed up and that was enough. And what I want to take you to at the end of that story of Job 42 is when Job then is encounters God and his three friends who have been giving him wise counsel all along about what he should be doing and how he should be responding, how, what happens to them. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls, seven rams, go to my servant Job, sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and will not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. You read 30 plus chapters of what Job says to God and it's bold. Let's show up, have a trial. People will see I'm right, God, and you're not. That's a pretty bold thing to say to God. How could God then affirm Job and say the three friends who were upholding and saying, oh, God is holy and just, and he'd never do something to anyone if they didn't deserve it. So, of course, Job, you must deserve this. Because Job wrestled with God. His friends explained God for God. And don't we all have a tendency sometimes to want to explain God for him so that people can understand what God's trying to do? I've been guilty of that. My goodness, as a pastor, sometimes people want you to do that. Would you please explain God to me? Well, what he's probably doing in your circumstances. Job wrestled boldly and brashly, but he held on, I think, like Jacob in the middle of the night and said, God, I need you. Even if you slay me, yet I will trust in you. But I don't think you're doing a great thing here. But God, I come to you. You're my only source of hope. The friends could explain God for God. Job sought God and leaned into God. He sought to meet with God and place his trust in God no matter the outcome. And so I end with this. Why do any of this? Why not just keep yourself busy, put your fingers in your metaphorical ears spiritually, and just go la, 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 happy, 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 joy, joy. I don't know what Kenny's been preaching on with joy, but here's what I know. When Kenny preaches on joy, I'm pretty confident that he's not preaching. Oh, don't worry. God loves you. It's all a happy thing. It's just happy, happy, joy, joy. The joy is the deep-seated reality of the blessing and love of God for a broken person like me and probably you who keeps trying to do it in their own way and in their own strength, but yet God keeps calling us back and saying, I love you. Experience relationship with me. And so why do all this? Because someone else wrestled with God first. In a garden called Gethsemane, the Savior of all the world who knew the plan from the beginning of the foundations of the earth being laid came to the precipice of when it was all going to happen and said, oh, this seems distinctly unpleasant to think about what I'm going to go through. Not just the physical suffering, which I think he knew was going to be astronomical, but the idea of becoming sin itself and being separated from the Father's presence and love on the cross for the first time in all eternity and said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And yet in his wrestling in the night, he said, yet not my will, but yours be done. The father, if you read the story of Hosea, wrestles with the nation of Israel and says, Israel, how can I give up? All my mercy is churned up within me. You deserve to be smited. But I can't because my love keeps getting stirred up despite your constant rebellion. 
Jesus wants to avoid the cross because he knows the misery that's coming, yet he wants to walk in the will and the power of what the Father has called him into for the redemption of all mankind. The Son, the Father, they've wrestled too. They've wrestled with my brokenness and my selfishness. They've wrestled with the call to go all the way to the cross. And from that love, they invite us to wrestle and hold on for dear life if we're willing to go meet with him in the darkness of the night. Brennan Manning has this quote that I love. What makes authentic disciples is not visions, ecstasies, biblical mastery of chapter and verse, or spectacular success in ministry, but a capacity for faithfulness. Buffeted by the fickle wind of failure, battered by rejection and ridicule, authentic disciples may stumble and they frequently fall, yet they keep coming back to Jesus. Authentic disciples, disciples may stumble and frequently fall, yet they keep coming back to Jesus. That's the invitation. That's why wrestling's worth it because it's authentic and real and speaks to the depth of the reality of what you're actually going through rather than living the numbing okayness of keeping ourselves distracted with all this world has to offer. So my invitation as I close, as we just take a minute, is to just ask the question, you know, you can't honestly go with God into the darkness of the night alone in this next minute but maybe his spirit can speak to you. And you can ask the question, is there anything I don't want to think about, wrestle with, or deal with? Because it just seems too hard. It's too uncertain. God can handle it. He met Jacob. He wrestled with Job. He spoke powerfully to Paul. He met with the Savior of all mankind and gave him the grace and strength to continue walking in the path that Jesus knew was his to carry. And he can do the same for you. So let's just take a minute to be silent and then I'll pray and I'll turn it back over to the worship team. Jesus, I don't know if I've communicated it well at all, but I don't think the joy that Kenny's preached about and what's been talked about today are that far apart. Because the word you gave to Paul was his joy. The revelation of your presence to Job was his joy. The surrender for the joy set before him enduring the cross, scorning and shame was Jesus's joy. And for Jacob to know that even though he didn't know what would happen with Esau next coming out of this wrestling match, that he could meet with God and experience his blessing, even if he walked with a limp going forward, was his joy. Because the greatest joy is not our circumstances getting fixed or going our way. The greatest circumstance is knowing and meeting the overwhelming presence and love of God and knowing that he calls me a son or a daughter and beloved in his own, no matter what I go through, that he will be enough. Lord, I pray my friends here, if you're calling them, would be willing to wrestle in the night, not to avoid, not to numb, not to be distracted, not to have a false view of you that just seems easier, but wrestles with you in the night just as these characters of scripture have, God. And may they find you, the real you, in the midst of it all, I pray. In Christ's name.
Amen. Oh, I was wandering through the desert. Ain't seen a cloud in forever over me. But I believe your rain is coming. Yeah. And I've been hanging on to high hopes. Cause you're the one who's making dry bones come to life. You're the light. I put my trust in Every word you said is gonna come true You will lead me to the promised land And everything you said is gonna happen Even though I haven't seen it yet And I will build a boat in the sand Where they say it never rains And I will stand up in faith I'll do anything it takes With your wind in my sail Your love never fails a faith I'll build a boat in a desert place And when the floods and the water starts to rise yeah, I'll ride the storm Cause I got you by my side With your wind in my sail Your love never fails a faith I'll build a boat so let it rain You're the map and you're my compass You help me navigate the currents under me Oh, take the lead, oh, I surrender And every word you say is gonna come true You will lead me to the promised land Everything you said is gonna happen Even though I haven't seen it yet oh, I will build a boat in the sand Where they say it never rains And I will stand up in faith I'll do anything it takes With your wind in my sails Your love never fails or fades I'll build a boat in a desert place And when the flood and the water starts to rise, yeah I'll ride the storm cause I got you by my side With your wind in my sails Your love never fails or fades I'll build a boat so let it rain oh, ooh, 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 ooh. I'll build a boat so let it rain Build the boat, so let it rain.